the current affairs of the 24th of March uh, 2022. The first topic that we'll discuss is about the merchandise trade crossing $400 billion. This is a huge moment for India. As till now, previously India's highest was $330 billion, which was in the pre-pandemic year of 2018-19. And this had fallen to around $292 billion in the pandemic year. So we are uh, recovering from this $292 billion and we have reached $400 billion again. Okay. Also, we'll discuss about the Mekadatu uh, water project. It is a dam that Karnataka is constructing on the Kaveri River. And Tamil Nadu has protested against this dam. We shall uh, discuss in, you know, small about the Kaveri Water Management Authority. And the other topics are pretty uh, static apart from this one, which we can discuss a little in detail. Uh, then we have the static syllabus of Artemis project. Then we'll discuss about the G20. And we'll also discuss in detail about the criminal justice reforms and the Malimath Committee recommendations. First topic. Please look at this infograph. Uh, these are the outbound exports from India, which are of higher value. Okay, now, the most uh, exported item out of India is naturally mineral fuels, mineral oils and products. These are after refining the crude oil. Whatever you get, those are the items which are being exported over here, while crude oil is imported in India. And then naturally, or cultured pearls, precious or semi-precious semi stones and metals, machinery and parts, well, this is the order of the things in terms of value that is being exported out. Now what is the news? India's annual goods exports crossed $400 billion mark for the first time ever, the government announced, buoyed by an increase in shipments of merchandise, including engineering products, apparel and garments, gems and jewellery, petroleum products. Okay. Now, the Commerce and Industry Minister asserted that neither the COVID-19 pandemic nor the global uncertainties following Ukraine crisis had affected India's ability to reach its export goals. Indian export had reached $330 billion in the pre-pandemic fiscal year of 2018-19. The boost in exports was likely to bolster India's position in the ongoing negotiations for free trade agreements with several trade partners. You know, this boost in trade a boost in exports can actually make India feel more confident when it is dealing with other countries for free trade agreements. Like say for example in dealing with, uh, if you remember India is going for free trade agreements with Australia, okay, with the uh, UK, with Israel, the Israeli Prime Minister is visiting India and also India has gone for a free trade agreement with UAE. So with all these countries, India can go for a more structured and more assertive free trade uh, free trade agreement. Also noting that the agricultural sector too had re recorded its highest ever export during 2021-22 with the help of export of rice, marine products, wheat, spices and sugar. Now, please remember that at the same point of time, India has a higher import of goods. Okay, while it its export is definitely increasing. India has a higher import of goods because of which India has a trade deficit. Trade deficit is nothing but import minus export of goods. And if the import is higher, then it is positive. So the trade deficit is high in India. While on the other hand, when we talk about services export, this is in the case of goods export. Okay, in the case of services export, India exports around say $230 billion of export services and imports only about $140 billion of export services. So India has a positive trade surplus when it comes to services export. It has a positive surplus as, compa as compared to goods. Okay, it has a positive of around say $90 billion. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, this is the difference between goods export and services export. India has a positive services export. Also, please remember that when it comes to uh, merchandise trade, okay, in the year 2020, there was a decline 
in the year 2020 to 2021 there was a decline in both the exports as well as the imports when it came to uh, goods okay and the decline in imports was higher than the decline in exports due to this the trade deficit in 2020-21 was lower in comparison to the previous financial years okay over here the imports were lower as compared to the previous years and hence the trade deficit was lesser in nature in 2020-21 as compared to the previous years now but the current account deficit now what is the current account deficit i told you that we spoke about the services exports over here so the current account uh, def current account is nothing but it includes uh, it includes the services it includes the merchandise as in the goods and it also includes net earnings on overseas investments and net transfer of payments such as remittances so net earnings on overseas investments like you have bought a land over there you have bought an apartment somewhere or uh, fdi fpi so net earnings on overseas investment and net transfers such as sending gifts se sending remittances all of this put together so goods exports and imports services exports and imports and all of this put together will give you the current account deficit or surplus okay now a country with rising uh, current account deficit shows that it has become uncompetitive and investors may not be willing to invest over there okay hence uh, in any country the current account uh, deficit could be reduced by boosting exports and curbing non essential imports such as gold you know uh, crude oil electronics etc okay so our goal also should be to reduce this current account deficit current account deficit includes the trade deficit you know it includes net invisibles which is nothing but services uh, exports minus imports and then net earnings on overseas investments net transfers and all of these now moving on what are these initiatives that the government has taken in order to improve exports the first and the foremost scheme that comes to our mind is the remission of duties or taxes on export product now what is this scheme this scheme was actually introduced in order to replace the existing merchandise export from india scheme the scheme was actually uh, at the wto at the dispute resolution body the scheme was faulted for and in its place india had brought in this remission of duties or taxes on exports it is a fully automated route for input tax credit in gst and this improves exports now say for example uh, in case some particular exporter is purchasing raw materials consumables goods or services that are used in the manufacturing of goods and services which are being exported out of the country okay now this person has to pay the customs duty in the other country also he has to pay several other taxes to add to this he is paying gst and all within the country so what the government is doing is that it provides all of this input tax credit which has been paid on the input materials the government returns it back in the form of credit okay so this itc is provided to set off the taxes paid on the purchase of raw, raw materials consumables and all of that this helps in avoiding double taxation and the cascading effect of taxes okay it was started only in january 2021 and as a replacement for the merchandise export from india scheme okay the tax refund rates range from 0.5% to 4.3% for various sectors okay the rate the rebate will be have to be claimed as a percentage of the freight on board value of exports freight on board value means the value of that freight on every shipment okay now it is implemented by the ministry of commerce and industry special economic zones okay i am very sure you know what a special economic zone is we also have a sec act a special economic zone is a territory we have discussed it uh, several times in the previous uh, uh, current affairs please go through those if you want more details on the special economic uh, zone 
It is nothing but a territory within the country that is typically duty free and has different business and commercial laws to encourage investment and create employment. SECs are created to also better administer these areas thereby increasing the ease of doing business. Now currently what are the benefits that SECs have? Okay, remember that whatever is produced under an SEZ, SEZ is produced from the point of view of exports. And hence, if at all these have to be brought back into India itself, then they have to pay a customs duty. Why? Because they are con considered as those things which are produced abroad. Now, benefits that are available to SEZs are duty-free import, domestic procurement of goods for development, operation and maintenance of SEZ units, Okay. Exemption from various taxes such as income tax, minimum alternate tax, they have lower payment of corporate tax. Are you seeing this? See, they don't need to pay a lot of import duties and all. They also are exempted from various taxes. External commercial borrowing limits for SEZ units are higher, much higher, $500 million per year. They also have single window clearances for central and state level approvals. Then you have had the Niriyad Bandhu scheme. It is implemented by the Director General of Foreign Trade, DGFT. This is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now, it is implementing the Niriyad Bandhu scheme for mentoring budding exporters on the intricacies of foreign trade. So it trains these exporters, exporters of, I mean, those people who have created MSME exports, it trains them on how you need to take loans for exports or which are the markets that you have to target and how to reduce the costs and all of this. Okay, given the rise of small and medium scale enterprises and the role in employing people, MSME clusters have been identified for focused intervention to increase exports. To achieve the objectives of the scheme, outreach activities are being organized in a structured manner with the assistance of the export promotion councils and other willing knowledge partners in academia and the research community. Thus, India has been taking several steps in order to improve exports. Okay, like what we just saw. Controversy over the proposed Mekadatu water project. Now, we had uh, earlier we had spoken about this under the Kaveri dispute between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Okay, now again, why is it in the news? Karnataka and Tamil Nadu are heading for political confrontation over the Mekadatu drinking water project across Kaveri proposed by the former. Within days of Tamil Nadu Assembly's resolution against the project, now Karnataka's Legislative Assembly is set to counter it with another resolution, seeking the project's early implementation. As Karnataka heads into an election year in 2023, the Mekadatu issue has been resonating within Karnataka and Tamil Nadu again. With Kaveri being an emotive issue that binds the people in the Kaveri Basin districts in Old Mysore region, Mekadatu is likely to impact election results, and hence there will be active uh, pushing against this particular Mekadatu issue. If you know, Mekadatu is nothing but a project which is being implemented on the Kaveri River in order to provide drinking water requirements for Bangalore. However, Ta Tamil Nadu believes that this uh, entire project, Mekadatu project goes against the Supreme Court, uh, you know, distribution of its share of Kaveri uh, water. And hence it has been opposing the Mekadadu project. In the 9000 crore, Mekadadu project aims to store and supply water for drinking purposes for Bangalore. Around 400 megawatts of power is also proposed to be generated. It was first approved by Karnataka state government in 2017 and has received approval from the Ministry of Water Resources for the detailed project report and is awaiting approval from the Ministry of Environment. Now, the reason why Ministry of Environment's approval is required is because it submerges a lot of area of the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, around 63%. Now, Tamil Nadu had approached the Supreme Court against the project because it believes that it goes against the Supreme Court verdict on Kaveri River. Earlier, the Supreme Court had given a verdict stating that, you know, rivers are not any state's property, rather they are the national treasure. It had followed the Helsinki rules and it had given that particular verdict. In this verdict, it had increased the share of Karnataka's water while reducing the same of Tamil Nadu's water. Now, Tamil Nadu stand. The project is against the final order of the Kaveri Water Disputes Tribunal, in which the Supreme Court held that no state can claim exclusive ownership 
or deprive other states of waters of interstate rivers. It has also held that reservoir is not just for drinking water alone, but to increase the extent of irrigation. If you remember, uh, I told you just now that Meghadatu is being created to increase the drinking water requirements of Bangalore. But Tamil Nadu contends that it is not just to increase the drinking water requirements of Bangalore, but also to increase irrigation. Uh, if you remember also, the Supreme Court, while giving its uh, Kaveri verdict, it had given water based on the irrigation that is done in the basin area and also based on the groundwater, uh, groundwater which is present in the basin area. And because Tamil Nadu had a good amount of groundwater in this region, its uh, share got reduced. According to Tamil Nadu, Karnataka has no right to construct any reservoir on an interstate river without the consent of the lower riparian state. What is this Kaveri dispute? From 1974, Karnataka started diverting water to its four newly made reservoirs without the consent of Tamil Nadu, resulting in a dispute. To resolve the matter, the Kaveri Waters Dispute Tribunal was established in 1990. Despite you know the problem starting in 1974, a tribunal had not been set up till 1990. Also, this was also set up only on the basis of a pandemic writ, which was issued by the Supreme Court, which took 17 years to arrive at a final order. Why? Now, this order was given also only after a 2002 amendment of Interstate River Water Disputes Tribunal, which said that within five years, a verdict should be published. And only because of that, this verdict was published in the year 2007, after 17 years, on how the Kaveri water should be shared between the four riparian states in a normal condition. In distress, in distress years, pro rata basis shall be used, it instructed. The go okay, in distress years, pro rata basis. And in normal years, it should be shared uh, between the four riparian states according to the uh, measurements given by the tribunal. The government again took six years in order to notify the order. Now, after notifying it, the verdict of the CWDT, I mean CDWT, was challenged through special leave petition in the Supreme Court, special leave petition under Article 136. And the final verdict of the Supreme Court came in 2018, where it declared Kaveri as a national asset, like what we just discussed. Said that no particular state has specific jurisdiction over Kaveri, rather it belongs to the entire nation. And it upheld the water sharing arrangement, which was finalized by the CWDT and reduced the allocation of water from Karnataka to Tamil Nadu. Now, Karnataka would get 284 Q6, Tamil Nadu would get 404 Q6, Kerala would get 30 uh, Q6, and uh, Pondicherry would get 7,000 uh, million cubic feet Q6. Okay. Okay, the Supreme Court had also notified the Kaveri Water Management Scheme. Now, under this Kaveri Water Management Scheme, we had nothing but the creation of the Kaveri Water Management Authority and the Kaveri Water Regulation Committee. This was directed by the Supreme Court. And the center went on to create these things in 2018. Now, what are the provisions of this Kaveri Water Management Authority? For this authority, the salaries have to be paid by the uh, separate states itself. I mean, Tamil Nadu has to pay 40% of the salary of these uh, authorities, members. And then uh, Karnataka has to pay 40%. Okay. While Kerala has to pay about uh, 15% and Puducherry has to pay the rest 5% of the salaries. Uh, it largely is according to the water division that the tribunal had pronounced. Also, this authority will comprise of around one chairman, one secretary and eight members. Out of the eight members, two will be full-time while two will be part-time members from the center side and the rest four will be members from the state's side, four from the center and four from the states. Now, the role of this Kaveri Water Management Authority is that it will implement the Supreme Court's order in relation to the storage and regulation 
of the Kaveri water. It will also, it'll also advise the states to take suitable measures to improve water use efficiency. Okay, measures to improve efficiency and then also it will uh, promote the use of micro irrigation change in cropping patterns improved farm practices development of command areas in order to reduce cavalry water usage micro irrigation and better farming practices in order to reduce the dependency on cavalry water and reduces the pressure on cavalry water okay it will also prepare an annual report covering its activities during the preceding years now moving on okay the next topic that we'll be discussing is the artemis program which is nasa's new program in order to land humans on the moon by 2024 that is the goal of nasa over here now uh, in this particular program you have three missions one is artemis 1 artemis 2 and artemis 3 okay moving on now why isn't it the news the nasa has rolled out its artemis 1 moon mission to the launch pad for testing at the kennedy space center the space launch system rocket this is the rocket that is being used and the orion capsule rocket and the capsule of the mission were hurled out to the launch pad by the nasa's crawler transporter 2 vehicle this is the transporting vehicle while these are the payloads uh, the space launch system rocket okay and the orion capsule now what is artemis program it is nasa's mission which is there for lunar exploration the program is divided into three parts artemis 1 artemis 2 and artemis 3 while artemis 1 involves an uncrewed flight to test the space launch system and the orion spacecraft artemis 2 will be the first crewed flight and it is targeted for 2023 and Artemis 3 will land astronauts on the moon's south pole by 2024. This is to understand more about the moon to ensure that, uh, you know, you, humans can uh, do mining on the moon for generation of hydrogen fuel on the moon and for several other things and for understanding the origins of the solar system. So this mission has several components to it and it has geopolitical uh, ramifications. Hence, it's a very important mission. Artemis 1 is aimed it's aiming to send an uncrewed spacecraft around the moon using a combination of the never before flown space launch system rocket along with the once flown Orion spacecraft. The space launch system rocket has never been used till now. Also, NASA hopes to extend the program with the moon orbiting crewed Artemis 2 mission and then a landing in uh, 2020, uh, then a landing in 2024 through the Artemis 3 program where nasa will be launching people onto the south pole of the moon okay now okay moving on artemis 1 is the first of nasa's deep space exploration systems it is an uncrewed space mission like what we just spoke where the spacecraft will be launched on sls the world's most powerful rocket and can travel 280,000 miles from the earth for over four to six weeks the Orion spacecraft is going to remain in space without docking. It doesn't dock to the International Space Station. Longer than any ship for astronauts has ever done before. The space launch uh, system rocket is uh, designed for space missions beyond the lower Earth orbit and can carry crew or cargo to the moon and beyond. So it is not just for lower Earth orbit. Okay, but rather for beyond lower Earth uh, orbit. With the Artemis program, NASA aims to land humans on the moon by 2024. And it also plans to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. This all is for Artemis 1. Okay. Now, with this mission, NASA aims to contribute. Please remember that it plans to, it plans to land humans on the moon by 2024. And also the first woman and the first person of color. Either brown or black or anyone. With this mission, NASA aims to contribute to the scientific discovery and economic benefits and inspire a new generation of explorers. 
It will also establish an Artemis base camp on the surface and a gateway in the lunar orbit. So on the surface of the moon, you have a Artemis base camp. While in the orbit around the moon, you have a gateway which will be established. And this will aid exploration by robots and astronauts by providing the necessary inputs to them. Gateway and the base camp. The gateway is a critical component of NASA's sustainable lunar operations and will serve as a multi-purpose outpost orbiting the moon. There are several agencies which are involved in this Artemis program, such as the Canadian Space Agency, such as the European Space Agency, then the JAXA, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. Now, what do these uh, different, different agencies do? The Canadian Space Agency has committed to providing advanced robotics for the gateway. While the European Space Agency will provide international habitat and spirit module which will deliver additional communication capabilities. Okay. Now the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency plans to contribute habitation components and logistics uh, resupply. So all these different different organizations are performing different tasks and it's not a NASA specific mission. Okay. Now moving on. Article 355 needed in Bengal. Parties in West Bengal have demanded that law and order situation in West Bengal is completely broken and Article 355 should be invoked to ensure that the state is governed as per the provisions of the constitution. Now please remember that Article 355, it states that it shall be the duty of the union to protect every state against external aggression as well as internal disturbance and to ensure that the government of every state is carried on in accordance with the provisions of this constitution. Okay, please remember that under Article 352, when the amendment was made, the 44th amendment was made, it removed the words internal disturbance and it replaced it with armed rebellion. Now this is because the emergency of 1975 was declared on the grounds of internal disturbance and since it is a very wide term it can be misused and hence this word was replaced with the word armed rebellion hence only in the case of armed rebellion can a national emergency be invoked on the march 21st there was a violent fight between two groups of the ruling party and the deputy pradhan was killed and in retaliation the houses in the area were attacked and set on fire resulting in 12 deaths including women and children all of them being members belonging to the minority community now what is the use of this article 355 it is extremely important when there are communal violence incidents or when there is a breakdown in the law and order okay subjects public order and police are state subjects we know this and states have exclusive power to legislate on the matters. Now, what if there is violence? What if there is communal violence? What if there is law and order situation? And the state does not interfere. And the state does not take proper action. In that case, this article can be invoked. These subjects were interested to the states because states would be in a better position to handle law and order problem. However, there might be some circumstances under which states are unable to maintain the public order and protect people. This might be because of vote bank politics. This might be because of caste based politics, religion based politics. In such a situation, center can invoke article 355 and take measures such as law and order of the state under its own hand, deployment of military. For this reason, article 355 was invoked. However, on the flip side, you know, on the other side, article 355 can be a means of the center to intervene in the affairs of the states. It can be a means of the center to control the law and order situation in the state, to control the police situation in the state. And also Article 355 can be a backdoor or Article 355 can be cited in order to impose precedence rule under Article 356. Article 356 states that or under Article 365. Article 356 states that in case you know, the functioning of the state machinery cannot be conducted in a manner as prescribed by the constitution, then the center can introduce precedence rule. 
and article 365 states that if any direction of the center has not been followed by the states then st uh, the president's rule can be introduced now so article 355 can be cited in order to introduce either president's rule through article 356 or 365 and hence it should be only used in a very sparse manner okay no china says that russia can't be ousted from g20 membership what is the g20 it is an informal group of 19 countries and the european union with representation from imf and the world bank it does not have a permanent set secretariat or headquarters rather whichever country it has a every year the chairmanship changes one particular country is in charge of the g20 and hence it has a moving secretariat so whichever country is the chair for g20 for that year it shall host the uh, temporary secretariat also okay its membership comprises of a mix of the world's largest and advanced and emerging economies representing about 2/3 of the world's population 85% of the global gdp 80% of global investment and 75% of global trade so it can be said that these 20 countries control most of uh, the economics that happen around the world okay why is uh, the g20 in the news because the us and its allies are assessing whether russia can be a part of the g20 following its invasion of ukraine please remember that earlier was a part russia was earlier a part of the g8 grouping of industrialized nations while g20 is a grouping of both the industrialized as well as emerging economies however after russia took over crimea in 2014 russia was ousted from g8 membership and the g8 became the g7 grouping of the seven industrialized economies but any move to exclude russia would probably be vetoed by the others in the group china which has not condemned russia's invasion defended moscow by calling russia as an important member of the g20 now the presidency of the g20 the g20 has no permanent staff of its own so every year a g20 country from a rotating region takes on the presidency this is what we had discussed earlier that country is then responsible for organizing the next summit as well as smaller meetings for the coming year they can also choose to invite non member countries along with other guests now how has the g20 evolved after the asian financial crisis this was the crisis in 1998 when there was a pull back of the foreign direct investment from emerging economies such as uh, thailand such as singapore uh, such as vietnam and all those east asian countries it was acknowledged that the participation of major emerging market countries is needed on discussions of international financial system okay because you know the fdi or because the investments in these tiger economies was pulled back at such a rapid scale it resulted in a, a global dip in the growth of the world itself the world went into a slowdown okay it went into a slowdown and slowly it went into a small re uh, recession as well and hence in order to avoid it it was decided that even emerging countries should be taken into account while making economic policies hence uh, the g7 finance ministers agreed to establish a g20 finance minister and central bank governors meeting in 1999 okay since then it became a permanent thing it became a permanent meeting of g20 finance ministers and central bank governors however after the global financial crisis of 2008 it was decided that uh there was a need to upgrade the g20's reputation as the premier crisis management and coordination body and hence in 2008 this g20 finance ministers and central bank governors meeting was elevated to the meeting of finance ministers level and central bank uh, level to heads of the state level and resulted in the first g20 summit so in 2008 it moved from finance minister and governor level to heads of state level this is the highest level that uh, any meeting in any intergovernmental body meeting can get to who are the members of the grouping argentina australia brazil canada china france germany india indonesia italy 
Japan, uh, Republic of Korea, South Korea, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Turkey, UK, the US and the EU. Okay, moving on. Criminal justice reforms. Okay, this topic is very important again. So, some of the reforms are given over here. Government can bring in a standalone legislation on the Bail Act. Limiting discretionary powers of courts in granting the bail. Okay. Also, uh, you can have this concept of restorative justice model where the victim also gets a role before the investigation is initiated and may negotiate and settle the dispute in a normal manner without going into investigation and prosecution. This is known as restorative justice. Okay. Or... Uh, using of CCTNS and uh, integration of CCTNS with e-courts and e-prisons, which means using more digitization when it comes to criminal justice. Okay, now, currently, why is it in the news? Aiming to make comprehensive uh, changes in the criminal laws, the government has initiated the process of amendment to laws such as IPC, CRPC and the Indian Evidence Act in consultation with all stakeholders. Currently, what are the issues in the criminal laws? There is a delay in the disposal of cases leading to human rights violations. Also, despite the Supreme Court's directions on police reforms, there has been no change in police reforms. Okay, Police are continuing to act in the same free-handed manner. They have excessive powers. And hence, we need to reform the police forces. This was given in the Prakash Singh case of the Supreme Court. Court orders convicting a person are also taking many years to implement. And also there are there is a huge discretion on the part of the Supreme Court. Okay, uh, every individual judge has his own formulation of coming up with uh, justice, and there is no overarching idea of justice that has to be followed. Even for similar crimes, you know the punishments that are being handed out are being different in different parts of the country. This has to be reduced. Recently, in the year two thousand and twenty. The Ministry of Home Affairs had appointed a national level committee for reforming the criminal law. This committee has been constituted under Ranbir Singh. Other committees for the same criminal justice reforms are Malimat Committee and the Madhav Menon Committee. Now, what are the reforms that have been suggested? Okay, Some of the reforms are special laws and fast track courts could replace certain offences under the IPC in order to reduce the piling up of cases at police stations and later at courts. Instead of having these, you can have special laws and fast track courts in order to handle those cases in a faster manner. Digitization of documents will help in investigation and uh, providing of proof. Construction of uh, new offenses and reworking of existing classification of offenses must be guided by principles of criminal jurisprudence, which have substantially altered in the past four decades. So we need to update our criminal justice. We have still been using the same Indian Evidence Act, which was formulated in 1861. And you also know that the CPC and the IPC and the CRPC, all of them are under, from since under the Britishers. And hence, they are not in line with the new uh, jurisprudence, which is there. Okay, classification of offences must be done in a manner conducive to management of crimes in the future. The discretion of judges in deciding the quantum and nature of sentences differently for crimes of the same nature should be based on principles of judicial precedent. See this. This is the issue that we are talking about. Even if there is a same crime, same murder, in the same grievous manner, there are discretionary there are discretionary judgments which are given by different different judges, and these judgments are very different from one another. So this should be reduced. Okay. Apart from this Mal Malim, apart from this Ranbir Singh committee, which was established in 2020, earlier in 2003, we had a Malimat committee and we had a Madhav Menon committee. What are the reforms which have been suggested by this Malimat committee? The committee does not favor death penalty. Rather, it says that wherever death penalty is there, you start having life term. It also gave the concept of restorative justice. Remember, one type of restorative justice is to involve the person in 
a settlement even before the investigation or prosecution uh, is done where the victim has a role to play and other type of restorative justice is the one where uh where uh, the victim gets a role before investigation is initiated and may negotiate the dispute like what we discussed okay over here the victim can either uh, ask for a sufficient compensation or he can ask for uh, you know any other return in order to drop the case rather than going into investigation going into prosecution increasing the piling of cases okay borrowing from the inquisitorial system this system is used in france the courts will conduct investigation and prosecution unlike now where the representatives conduct prosecution currently who conducts the prosecution right now it is either the government which conducts the prosecution okay you have the government appointed law- lawyers or you have the you have uh, the private persons appointed lawyers and they conduct the prosecution while in the case of an inquisitorial system it is the courts that will conduct both the investigation and the prosecution currently the investigation is conducted by the law enforcement agencies like the police in this inquisitorial system all these people police lawyers all of them they will be under the court and the court will be monitoring the entire investigation and prosecution rather than the government monitoring investigation and prosecution okay courts would be bestowed powers to summon any person whether listed or not for examination okay courts to move from proof beyond reasonable doubt to convinced that it is true approach setting up of a police establishment board for dealing with postings and transfer of police people so in order to reduce and bring in these police reforms the malimat committee had established a police uh, establishment board which deals with postings and transfers rather than happening in a haphazard manner also the malimat committee recomm- recommended some other uh, you know ideas such as it held that from now on confessions made before a superintendent of police we know that in india confessions which are made before police are not valid as evidence in a court of law however the committee said that confessions made before the superintendent of police can be admitted as an evidence in the court of law also for false registration of cases by police people through threats and all of that for or by normal people false registration of cases should be treated as a stringent offense and people should be punished for it this will reduce the piling up of cases okay moving on criminal law in india is contained in a number of sources such as the ipc uh, cpc dowry prohibition act scheduled castes etc scheduled caste prevention of atrocities act the criminal justice system can impose penalties on those who violate these laws the criminal law and the criminal procedure are in concurrent list of the constitution okay and these laws were uh, done by the britishers and it was the macaulay commission which was the chief architect of codification of criminal laws in india